continuing our studies in Acts chapter 2, in verse 29 through 31. The men and brethren, who's speaking? Peter, isn't it? Is it Peter? Or all the apostles? See, we're given the speech of Peter, but we need to remember that it was all of the apostles who were addressing these people because they were listening to them in their own language. If only Peter was speaking, 11, uh, 11 12 of them couldn't understand a thing. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to set on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul would not be left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now, when we began this section, if we backed up a little bit, we'd see that, that David... Uh, talked about seeing one whose soul would not remain in Hades in verse 27. Here we are two verses later, and he's talking about it again. How did these people know that David was not prophesying about himself? Well, when we look at it, we see that David's tomb was with them to that day. After hundreds of years, David's tomb is still there. And they know that David has decayed, as all men do. The moment we die, our bodies literally start decaying. And they know that his body is still in that tomb. So how could he be speaking of David himself? He has to be speaking about someone else. In Psalm 16 and verse 10, we have an interesting passage. He says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Obviously, in that passage, uh, looking ahead, prophesying as David was a prophet, prophesying ahead, he's obviously talking about someone other than himself. Why? Because when he dies... He's going to start decaying. And notice that David is called a prophet. Now remember a prophet, and, and I emphasize this a lot because so many people have the wrong idea of what a prophet is. This prophet uh, was not revealing himself, but he was revealing the eternal one, the Christ. And, he, and, and as he spoke, he was speaking what God told him to say. Uh, he wasn't, you know, uh, let's see, I'll make up this story about uh, this man or this family or whatever it is. He, could on, he was only allowed to speak prophetically what God told him to speak, nothing else. And so it was that in this prophecy and in other passages that we look at with regard to David and the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, Kings, and we, we see that God had promised him that his descendants would one day reign on a throne. Now, initially, that wouldn't be a surprise to David because his son Solomon followed him on the throne. And in those days, most of the time, someone's son, if you were a king, unless you were deposed or overthrown by what we call a riot today, then your son followed you on the throne, and then his son followed him on the throne, and on and on it would go until you were either conquered by another people or the lineage ran out or uh, the people rebelled and overthrew the throne. And so one day God said, David, there's going to be someone on a throne. Hmm. To him that overcometh, I want you to notice this word throne. To him that overcometh will I, who? 
speaking, Jesus, will grant to set with me in my throne. Do you realize that someday you and I, if we remain faithful to God, are going to set with Christ on his throne? That's what the Bible says. What is a throne? It's a representation of power. It's a representation of authority. We will sit on his throne. Doesn't that bring a little information to us when we read passages that tell us that we will judge the 12 tribes of Israel? Isn't that interesting? But notice something else as that passage continues. Even as I also overcame, even as I also overcame, Jesus says, even as I also overcame am, and am set down with my Father in his throne. And that nails it down for us. Jesus said, just like me, when I overcame, I sat down with my Father in his throne. He says, you are going to be the same way. That's us. We will sit down with him in his throne. How? By remaining faithful to him. Look, look at Revelation 3.22. He that hath an ear, very next verse, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This nails it down. It's not just speaking about Jesus. It's not just speaking about the apostles. It's speaking about us. We are the church. Listen. You know, that uh, phrase is, is found over and over in various forms. Hear, listen. God urges you and I to listen to what he has to say. Not just with a casual uh, attitude or casual listen. You know, sometimes we kind of half listen to something while we're paying more attention to something else. Or, or I, I know Jenny can do this. Uh, she can be talking to somebody and hear what's going on over here. Because she does that to me all the time. And I think she isn't hearing what I'm saying, but she is. At the end of the Old Testament era, David's physical throne was empty. There was no person on the throne of David for over 400 years. Nobody was on that throne. But wait, God promised, and God never lies. So where is this one to sit on the throne? Now, you and I know the answer to that, don't we? You know, you're probably sitting there saying, well, I know that. Come on, Bob. What else? Do I? No, that's important. The throne had been empty for all of this time. They were under Roman rule. The throne was in Rome. The throne wasn't in Jerusalem. Now, look at verse 32. This Jesus, he continues and tells them, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Now, who's speaking? It's the apostles. Who's been speaking since the Holy Spirit came upon them and overwhelmed them and sat on each of them in tongues like as a fire? It's been the apostles who was criticized as being drunken to try and diminish uh, their authority, to try and cause people to look at them and say, nah, they, we don't need to pay attention to them. It was the apostles. Peter's speech is the one being recorded for us, but we must not forget they were all speaking on that at that time. And they're saying the same thing. And we can prove this a little later in the text. David, now remember, has predicted a resurrection. And Peter says, we all are witnesses of what? 
that God indeed raised up the one that David was talking about. They were eyewitnesses that Jesus had been resurrected. They had direct knowledge of Jesus' resurrection. You know, uh, John talks about this in one of his minor epistles, as we sometimes call them. He said they had seen, heard, and I forget the exact language, but uh, uh, looked at them intently. Uh, you know, they didn't just casually see him at a glance. They were able to observe him very intently. And then there was something else. They touched him. They were truly witnesses of everything that Jesus had done. Everything that he said. They had an intimate relationship with him, being around him all the time. But you and I can't be witnesses today. In fact, the time when the Bible talks about witness being witnesses, it's talking about the apostles. I don't know of a, a single exception to that. You and I cannot be witnesses of Jesus today. Because a witness has to have direct knowledge. They have to have actually seen what they're testifying about or heard it from, with their own ears or been able to touch the person that they may be talking about. You and I can't be witnesses. Why? Because we receive our information of Jesus. We see him through the mind's eye of faith. We don't see him directly. We see him indirectly. Our knowledge of Jesus is through the written word. It's not direct knowledge. Now look at verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, who? This Lord that was going to be, that David said, my, and he said to my Lord. By the way, that passage the first Lord in it is Jehovah, and the second one is Lord. So he's right by the right hand of God, exalt this one that David prophesied about, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, and hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Wasn't enough to see it, had to hear it. So if Jesus came forth from the grave, we ask the question, where is he? Does the text tell us? Well, yeah. Where is he? He's at the right hand of God. Well, where's God? That is the Father. Well, he's in heaven. So Jesus is in heaven, right? He's on his throne. He's on his Father's throne. With him, remember the text said. Now, who then received the promise of the Holy Spirit? It's interesting to think about because we, we think about the Holy Spirit in a lot of ways, and the world around us really has some peculiar ideas about the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm afraid much of the world around us thinks that he's kind of like Casper, you know, the friendly ghost. Uh, that's not the Holy Spirit at all. He's the third person of the Godhead. He is God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So who received the promise of the Holy Spirit? It's the one who was at the right hand of the Father. And he did something with that. He was given the Holy Spirit for a purpose for him then to give it to the apostles. That's John 14 and John 16. So who shed forth then what they saw and heard? It's the one at the right hand of the Father. What was given to Jesus that exalts him? The Spirit of God. Notice John 13, 33 and 34. He that hath received his testimony has set to his seal 
that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. And notice, the Spirit had been given to Jesus. And all along, Jesus was planning that he was going to be leaving this world. He was only here for a short time. You know, you, you think about how brief a time he was here in this world, and yet there's no figure in history that can even begin to match him, is there? There's not a one. His influence has, has continued down through the ages. And as long as this world continues, it's going to continue to exercise authority. Now, some people will claim authority when they have none through him, but his authority is never going to end as long as this world is in existence. And God gave him the spirit, and he gave it to him without measure. Now, watch what David then goes on to say in verse 34. David is not ascended into the heavens. Well, he's been telling them basically this all along. Well, his tomb's still here. Well, who's in his tomb? David. David has not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. Again, that first word, Lord, is Jehovah. Is speaking of the Father. The second word, Lord, is speaking of a ruler who would be sitting on this throne. Who is that ruler? It's Jesus. Peter was again appealing to the prophet David. Uh, he's making his point again by using the Old Testament. It is amazing when you sit down and you look at all the references in the New Testament to the Old Testament. And yet, why should that be surprising to us? Because we remember in the book of Galatians, don't we? Chapter 1, what was the purpose of the Old Testament? To lead people to the Christ. To give prophecies about Him that could only be fulfilled. A multitude of them that only could be fulfilled. Over 300 of them that could only be fulfilled by one individual, that is, all of them. So Peter goes back again to the Old Testament, and he goes back to David. He's been talking about David quite a bit. Why? Because the people had an extremely high regard for their former king, David. Just like they had a high regard for Elijah. The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalm 110.1 Notice that it's plainly stated that David was not in heaven. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Why wasn't David in heaven? Was it because he was evil and, and so God wouldn't let him in heaven? Look at Hebrews 11, 32 through 34. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Who are all these people? When we go back and we study the Old Testament, we see that these people were people who were faithful to God. Not perfect. <laughs> you can look at David's life and he wasn't perfect, was he? But he was faithful to God. These are listed here as what we call the heroes of faith. The faithful, those who inherit the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God. Every one of them. 
By the way, isn't it interesting that Jephthah's name comes just before David's? And some of the beliefs that some people have, have fantasized about Jephthah, oh, he, he literally sacrificed his daughter. But wait a minute. If he'd done that, God would have severely condemned him, and there is no indication that God condemned him. That's an interesting study. I'm not going to get into it tonight, but if you'll go and study it, if you will study especially the wording, people have drawn the conclusion that Jephthah literally sacrificed his daughter. But if you study, and by the way, almost everybody has access to the ability to, to know what the wor original words say, you'll find out that the daughters went to her year by year and she remained a perpetual virgin, never married. And that's what it's talking about. But here we're talking about the faithful of God. Well, where they're not in heaven. Well, how do I know that? Because our text said David's not in heaven. And when you think about that, he's listed as one of the heroes of faith along with these others. What does that do to the argument of some today who say, oh, you know, when a person dies, they go straight to heaven? If a faithful servant of God who is extolled by God over and over in the New Testament and is plainly said not to be in heaven today, what does that do to people who argue or try to say, well, you know, when you die, you go straight to heaven? Well, you and I know that our Lord never told a lie. Mm -mm, he never told a lie. He never committed any sin. He never did anything wrong to someone. And our Lord told us about a man, a rich man, and a man named Lazarus. And he told us about a place that is called the Hadean world, separated by a gulf. One side is paradise. The other side is punishment. You can't cross, ever. What does that do to the doctrine of Catholicism that teaches that, you know, if you were a bad person, we'll bury you in the worst part of the cemetery. And they literally do this. I've seen it done. But if you pay enough penance and offer enough prayers, then you can move up. What does it do to those things? David was not in heaven. David is not in heaven today. I want you to notice David's words. The Lord Jehovah said unto my Lord, that is the Christ. Who was sitting at the right hand of God? It's Jesus, the Lord. It's not David. It's Christ. The one who was raised from the dead that the text has just talked about, the context. So how long, let me ask this question, how long will Christ be at the right hand of his Father? Now be careful before you answer that. It's in the trick. But some people may think it's a may want to think, well, what, of course, I know where he is. He's, he's on the throne in heaven, and he's always going to be there with his Father. Uh, let's think about this. The text says, until all his enemies are destroyed and made his footstool. The word, of, the word footstool is used from the imagery that was often used in those times with combat. Two armies went against each other. Two kings would go against each other in combat with all of their fighting men, and one of them would lose, usually. Now, sometimes it's tied, like uh, the Hittites and uh, I forget the Pharaoh of Egypt that he claimed victory and of course, they claim victory, but there's actually a tie. They, nobody won. A lot of people died. But when you think about it, 
the footstool was the idea that when one king conquered the armies of the other king, they would then capture that king if he wasn't killed in combat, and he would have to come before the conquering king and bow down before him, prostrate himself down on the ground, and the king would literally put his foot on either the back of his neck or his head. And it signified that he had been conquered, that he had no uh, ability now to defend himself, and he must obey the new king. Now, many times after that little ceremony was done, they chopped the head off of the king. But the idea is conquered, to make subject to someone. That's the original word, polos. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26. And remember, we're talking about Jesus is going to be at the right hand of his father, our text says, until his enemies are made his footstool. All of them. Well, what's the last enemy to be destroyed? Death, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. So if we get this picture right, Jesus is now, right now, sitting with his father on his father's throne. How long is he going to sit there? Until all his enemies are made his footstool. And what's the last enemy? It's death, physical death. Look at verse 36 now. Therefore, because all of this has been stated, because it's been stated that, that one was going to be on David's throne, but it wouldn't be a, uh, uh, one of his son's son's sons, and yet, in a sense, as the Hebrews use the word, any male relative fit the idea of a son at some point in time. But then the, the monarchy had been interrupted for over 400 years. Where's this king going to come from? And he says, this king... He's going to rule. Well, you've got to have a throne to rule, don't you? Oh, where's Jesus now? Sitting with his father on his throne, we noticed, until his enemies have been made his footstool. Until. Hmm. That indicates that a time is coming when it's not going to be the case anymore. Think about it. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And we know that those words really struck a chord because they, they could see the evidence. They understood the prophecies. They knew that those were prophecies about the coming Messiah. And David had spoken about them, and it wasn't David himself that it was spoken about. It's the Christ, the Messiah. And they killed him. No, that's not right. They murdered him. You may kill someone accidentally. You may kill someone by execution. But when you murder someone, it suggests that they didn't do anything to deserve that. Especially when you talk about the Christ. And these people got it. About 3,000 of them, they got it. Can you even begin to imagine the hurt that they must have had? when all of a sudden they realize we murdered the Messiah, the one we, we said we were looking for all this time, the one that so much had been spoken about. You know, a person, I've talked to a number of people over the years that accidentally killed someone. 
uh, you know, for instance, as an idea that uh, they, this person walked out from between two cars and the driver didn't see him and ran over him and killed him. Even though they didn't intentionally do it, that hurt stays with them all of their lives. A lot of folks being hurt here. It's going to be verified in verse 37. You and I must be careful with our words and our actions. We should never intentionally want to hurt anyone. That, that should sadden us when we do uh, like no other. And, and every one of us have hurt somebody with our words at one time or another. And when we do that, it ought to hurt us. It ought to sadden us that, that we sunk to that level of sin. We shouldn't say words that uh, just for the purpose of hurting someone, and neither should we say them, I, I hesitate to use the word accidentally. We need to be very, very careful. But remember something. These weren't Peter's words that hurt these people to the quick. And if you and I are teaching God's word, and we're not being ugly about it, we're not being vindictive about it, we're not wanting to hurt somebody, if those words hurt them, we need to remember something. Those aren't, God, aren't my words, those are God's words. When we tell someone they need to be baptized for the remission of their sins, and we back it up with Scripture, that's God speaking. These are not Peter's words, and by the way, we're not God. I, I think you all realize that. I'm not saying that. These aren't Peter's words. These are God's words. And the truth, scriptural truth, Bible truth, religious truth, belongs to God. And God's word is always going to hurt those who are in sin unless, unless they have become so calloused that they can't feel the prick of God's words when they're spoken or when they read them. You know, a cow is an interesting creature. You're probably thinking, where is this going? In the Old West, in order to identify an animal as belonging to you, what'd you do? You branded them, right? You got a fire and got it red hot and you got an either a running iron, that is one you'd, you could draw, or one that had been fashioned in such a way that it put a particular mark on the end, and you got it red hot. And once it was red hot, they caught the, the animal that was usually the cows more than any other to be branded, and they tackled them and got them down on the ground, and tss, then they let the cow go. You know that when that healed up, you could take a pin and poke it in that place. Cow wouldn't do anything. Couldn't feel it. The nerve endings had all been burned so that there was no feeling. But if you took that same pin and poked it in an area where it wasn't branded, that tail is probably going to come flying around there thinking it's a fly. We can become so hardened to truth, so callous to truth, that we can't feel the hurt that God's Word is intended to do by Him in order to get us to correct our actions or be more like what He wants us to be. God's Word is always going to hurt those who are in sin, especially those who refuse to give up their sins. Look at Galatians 4.16. The Apostle Paul on one occasion 
talking to these Galatians who had listened to him, had obeyed the gospel in the past, and now were turning their backs to the gospel. And his words obviously were hurting them. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Folks, we're going to have people who will become our enemies because we do tell them the truth. Oh, they may express it in a lot of different ways. They, they may, you know, I ain't going to be around that person anymore. Why, they're going to tell me the truth, and, and I don't really want to hear the truth because I like what I'm doing. Oh, it may be that they get so mad, maybe they'll punch us out. Or, or maybe even get to the point where they'll kill us. I read recently about a woman who turned in her relative because they had violated the law in a, in a pretty heinous way. And since she was the only witness, her relative killed her. She told the truth about the man. Now, we're not talking about it in a religious sense, but she told the truth about the man, and what did he do? He killed her. Truth is always going to sting the conscience of the wicked if they still have any feeling at all. It will accomplish one of two things. It will accomplish either repentance or hatred and resentment of the one who's speaking the truth. There may be other shades of those things going on, but basically it's going to be, it will either cause repentance or it will cause a hatred. So notice the charge that uh, Peter and the other apostles have made. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Did they do this to the Son of God? God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Christ, Messiah, Lord, ruler, you crucified Jesus. You thought you could get rid of him. You thought you could get rid of his message. And you crucified him. But he is your ruler, and he is the Messiah that came to this world for you. You murdered Jesus, the Son of God. But look what God did. God made him Lord and Christ. He's the one in authority. Notice then the contrast that we see between the Jews who crucified him and God. On the one hand, the Jews, they mocked Jesus. They spit on him. They, they caused him to be flayed and ridiculed by the Romans, ridiculed them themselves, caused him to be crucified. On the other hand, God honored Jesus. He honored him by making him king, their ruler. He honored him by setting him on his own right hand, in his own throne. And when we look at the scriptures, we see that there are two other classes of people that are anointed by God. Besides Jesus, the prophets and the priests, both had to be anointed to fulfill their office. In the physical realm, the kings of Israel also had to be anointed. Now, we do the same thing basically today. You say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> we didn't anoint the President of the United States. We didn't take, you know, oil and pour it on his head. We did basically the same thing. He had to put his hand on a Bible and take an oath of office. No difference, really. Jesus fulfilled all of these offices, and he's the only one who did. He was prophet, priest, and king. But two of these 
he could not fulfill while he was upon the earth. He couldn't be a priest because he had to come from the tribe of Levi. God didn't crown him as a king until he sat on his right hand on the throne in heaven. So how are the people going to respond to this charge that's been made against them? Remember, they have basically flat out told them, you're murderers. You murdered an innocent man. In fact, he wasn't just a man. He is God. He's the Son of God. Now, that's where we're going to stop because next week we'll pick up with verse 37.